Hello everyone. So I'm continuing my uh, series on uh, English law, particularly looking at the judicial system. And uh, this uh, talk is going to be about precedent. So what's gone before, what's preceded a certain decision, courts have to look back to that and have to follow precedent unless there's some overridingly strong reason why not to. So um, the high court binds the courts below it uh, in the judicial system. Remember, courts are in tiers with the Supreme Court at the apex, followed by the Court of Appeal and the High Court and so on. We're looking at the, the civil division in this case. So below the High Court, we have county courts, the, the magistrates' courts and uh, different types of tribunals. Um, and um, of course, above the High Court, well, I just, just pointed out which ones are, are above it. So the divisional courts um, above the High Court as well. So um, it's not bound by other High Court cases, the High Court itself, um, which are heard by a single judge. But there's sometimes a, um, a long list of settled cases which are usually persuasive. Um, it is rare for them to, to, get, to go against this. A um, um, best known example is Rylance and Fletcher, an 1866 case, and um, that was heard in the High Court at first. Uh, later on, it was heard in the Court of Appeal, and lastly, in the House of Lords. So the appeals, um, they both went with the High Court judgment, and that was based on a long litany of High Court judgments. So um, what was the outcome? That created a new kind of tort, and it's known as Rylance tort. So Lord, Lord Neuberger in Willis and Joyce, a 2016 case, said, so far as the High Court is concerned, um, puny judges are not technically bound by the decisions of their peers, but they should generally follow a decision of a court of coordinate jurisdiction unless there's a powerful reason for not doing so. So the divisional courts of the High Court, they um, bind all the courts below them, including um, single judge courts of the High Court, not um, multiple judge courts of the High Court, and they themselves are bound by the Lords and the Court of Appeal. Now let's look at appeals. So there's an exception to this, and that's the, Queen ben the Queen's Bench Division Court. Um, uh, so appeals from any division of the High Court or divisional courts uh, can be made to the Court of Appeal um, or with permission, as in we say with leave, but it means permission in this case. So um, the, the applications have to be submitted um, by a certain deadline, that's four weeks of the judgment. Beyond that, too late. However, yet again, there's another exception, and that's if the appeal to the High Court um, may lie direct from the, the High Court, this is a procedure which is called leapfrogging. So if you want to uh, take advantage of the leapfrogging procedure, the parties must agree, and the High Court Appeal Committee must also um, give you um, its approval to do so, um, and it must involve some crucial point which is of import to, to the general public. The reasoning behind this is that because these cases um, um, would end up in the High Court anyway because they're so vital, and that speeds up the things and, it, and it, you can just um, leapfrog over the Court of Appeal, hence the expression uh, leapfrogging. Um, okay, so this uh, the, the, the good point about this is it speeds things up and it reduces cost. Um, so uh, this is under the Administration of Justice Act 1969, um, and that was that was previously for the House of Lords, which is now the Supreme Court. That's a new version of it. Well, let's look now to the county courts. So what are they and how do they work? Well, there are more than 300 of them in England and Wales, and they hear nine-tenths of civil law claims. Um, there are about 150 statutes uh, which say that county courts only can deal with these matters, and county courts are, uh, um, hear cases without juries. So the county courts, um, they are in charge if it's something to do with tort or um, contract. Um, they also um, are there to do, they deal with matters of probate, as in the will, what's proven to be in the will, that probate is proven, or indeed divorce cases, and they sometimes deal with admiralty cases if they're less serious. Um, in certain matters which are too grave for them, they'll be sent up to the High Court. There are certain issues of professional, professional negligence which come before a county court, um, an accident resulting in death, or um, civil actions against the police. So there's um, uh, a ruling called practice discretion, county court concurrent jurisdiction listings from 1991. So um, 
uh, certain actions are dealt with at first instance by the High Court. Now, there are three different kinds of judges which sit in the High Court. There are the circuit judges, the recorders, and district judges. Tony Blair's wife, Cherie Blair, she was a recorder, but she was known as um, Miss, Miss Booth in her professional life. If a woman becomes a barrister and she's a Miss when she's called, as she usually is, she's Miss whatever, Miss Booth in this case, even if she gets married professionally, she, still, she remains Miss Booth. Um, so um, the most senior judge is a circuit judge uh, in this case. Recorder's jurisdiction is um, uh, akin to that of a circuit judge, but these are usually part-time posts. Take the case of Miss Booth because she was also um, running her own practice as well as sometimes sitting as a recorder. Um, the, uh, so she, she dealt with the, the uh, less serious matters. Um, now, the most junior rank in the judiciary is the district judge, DJ, people sometimes call them. The circuit judges and recorder judges, they um, are, are appointed by the Queen um, when the Lord Chancellor advises her to do so. Um, district draws, judges are appointed by the Lord Chancellor, not by the Queen. So there, there are small claims for under um, uh, £10,000, or if it's a case of injury, under £1,000. These are um, uh, go, go before a district judge unless um, if there is some question of law which has to be settled. Um, this is um, this hearing is not very formal at all, which is why they're sometimes without lawyers. You can have a you can have a solicitor if you want, or even a barrister, but that would be that would be overkill. And it's this this procedure is known as the small claims procedure, commonly called the small claims court. So cases when they um, are heard by the high court is usually because there is a highly abstruse legal point which needs to be dealt with, or the amount of compensation is over that limit of £10,000. So claims with um, particular areas of law, such as mortgages or someone declaring bankruptcy, these um, are dealt with by particular statu statutory provisions. And um, the uh, that means that they, um, the county court or the high court has to deal with them. So let's look at precedent in this area. Uh, the county court does not create precedent. It follows the precedent set by the High Court, Divisional Courts, Court of Appeal, and of course, the the um, uh, the Supreme Court, which is the top of the pyramid. So appeals um, in these sort of courts. Now, in the old days, appeal courts, uh, county court appeals went to the to the Court of Appeal. But after the year 2000, there was a new piece of legislation, Act as Access to Justice, 1999, which kicked in in 2000, known as Destination of Appeals. Um, and appeals from the county court, apart from bankruptcy ones, they um, usually go to the High Court um, and not to the Court of Appeal. However, um, there are some unusual circumstances in which they would go to the Court of Appeal. Again, that's pursuant to the Access to Justice Act 1999. So when it comes to decisions um, about uh, the county court on bankruptcy cases or something similar, the um, uh, appeals go to the Chancery Division Court. Now, coming to the magistrates' courts, these this is for civil proceedings. Uh, they don't usually deal with civil proceedings because it's mostly a criminal court. However, they, they can deal with some civil matters, um, particularly if they pertain to local government, your um, your local, local authority, unitary authority, county council, borough council, whatever it's called, um, city council. So this is about administrative law. And there are certain rules relating to public roads, to public health, the licensing of shops, restaurants, um, other public accommodations, uh, hotels, guest houses, things like that. So the um, legal powers of the magistrates' court um, are things such as ordering dogs to be put down if they're perilous, or indeed handling disputes about property which is um, which has been confiscated by the police, and they've been granted these these. Um, powers by statute. So magistrates usually have the legal power to order council tax to be paid or water charges to be paid, uh, charges for electricity, gas and so forth. So the magistrates have um, some appellate jurisdiction, um, uh, which is mainly civil. Um, right. An obvious example is driving licenses. So um, you can appeal to a higher court um, uh, after the magistrates, they take away your license without good reason, you're unlikely to get it back. So what precedent binds the, the, the magistrates' court? Well, obviously the superior ones, magistrates' courts do not create precedent because they're the lowest one. So let's look at appeals. So um, you can appeal from the magistrates' court um, on, on a point of law to the Queen's Bench Division Court. 
Um, so uh, it's only written evidence, there are no oral submissions. So coming on to the family court, how does it work? Well, in the old days, um, these family matters were dealt, by dealt with by magistrate courts or the county courts. And then there was the Matrimonial and Proceedings uh, Act of 1984 and the Crime and Courts Act of 2013 created a new family court which began sitting from 2014. And this has jurisdiction over all familial matters. So what precedent binds them? Well, um, obviously, um, they, the, the family courts, it unites lots of the lower tiered courts. And there are different kinds of judges there. There are the lay magistrates, as in they don't have a particular legal training, lay justices, district judges, circuit judges, and others. And they're all they're considered as a family court. So what's the outcome? It's hard to say what the do what doctrine of precedent applies there, um, possibly because they don't create precedent. And that's the same as the county court or indeed the magistrate's court. So appeals therefrom. Well, you this this varies according to which kind of judge we're dealing with in the case or what matter is is, is before the court. So the appeal can go to a higher judge um, inside the family court, can go to the high court or indeed to the court of appeal. So um, if that sounds complex, well, it is. So on to criminal courts. Obviously, there's a Supreme Court right at the top. But um, below that, we've got Court of Appeal, Criminal Division. Court of Appeal's got Criminal Division, Civil Division. The Court of Appeal, Criminal Division, that was set up in 1966, and um, it used to be called the Court of Criminal Appeal. So who's the head of it is um, the Lord Chief Justice. He's also the head of Judiciary and, um, and the head of Criminal Justice. President of the Courts of England and Wales is sometimes called. Currently, it's Lord Bernard, uh, Bernard of Malden. So uh, the this division it usually sits in two courts. It could sit up in up to five. Now, for the most part, there's the Lord Chief Justice. Sometimes there are other Lord Justices of Appeal, um, others from the Queen's Bench Division. So they have there's precedent here. Of course, their decisions are binding on all the courts below them in the hierarchy, and that includes, of course, the the um, Divisional Court of the Queen's Bench Division. So the Court of Deville Appeal is bound by the Supreme Court and its its um, predecessor, the Supreme Court, and indeed the the Court of Appeal is bound by its own prior decisions. Um, again, following Young and Bristol Airplane Company Limited, which I mentioned a bit uh, in my previous talk, um, so they they have to primarily look at doing justice in the particular case, um, uh, rather than certainty. Yes, certainty is important, but if the two collide, it's justice which prevails. An example would be the Crown against Taylor, 1950. So Lord Goddard, who was a Chief Justice at the time, he said the court has to deal with questions involving the liberty of the subject. And if it finds on reconsideration that the opinion of the court, the law has either been misapplied or misunderstood in a decision which had previously been given, and that on the strength of the decision an accused person has been sentenced and imprisoned, it is a bounded duty of the court to reconsider the early decision. The exceptions which apply in civil cases ought not to be the only ones applied in the case as the precedent, as the present. So Lord Goddard was saying that um, um, precedent is less important in the criminal division than it is in the civil division, because um, if we get this wrong, this is someone going to prison for a very long time, or indeed a baddie getting away with it, or indeed an innocent person going to the gallows. Anyway, uh, this is fascinating, and it goes against the practice statement, which says that um, the need for predictability and consistency um, trumps all. Um, and that's why you, you should be very hesitant about breaking with precedent in matters criminus. Um, however, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division um, is, uh, as I said, is, is, is more willing to disregard precedent than the Civil Division. Um, so the, sometimes it does so, and that's in a cult full when they've got five judges on the bench, not a mere three. So how about appeals in this division? Now, those go up to the Supreme Court, of course. Um, so the prosecution or it can appeal not just the defence. Um, but uh, it's dissimilar to, to appeals from the Court of Appeal, uh, Civil Division, because you have to have two conditions which are fulfilled. Firstly, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division must say that a point of law of general public important importance is at stake. And secondly, um, that the... Sorry, uh, where was I? And the, the second... Uh, the second uh, the condition that they must fulfill for um, uh, this, this to happen is that, ah, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. I've lost my place. Um, the second thing that they've got to say um, is that, uh, I'll get there eventually. What did I say? Um, 
Yeah, the, the Court of Appeal, the Criminal Division of the Supreme Court must be um, uh, convinced that the point of law uh, is one which is, is fit to be heard by the Supreme Court, can't be dealt with lower down in the hierarchy. So on to the Queen's, Queen's Bench Division, Administrative Court. So um, what is the, the makeup of it and how does it work? Well, as again, that's part of the Queen's Bench Division, and it used to be called the Queen's Bench Divisional Court. So it deals with criminal cases, uh, criminal appeals um, uh, from the from Magistrates Court, and it can also listen to appeals from the Crown Court. Uh, if the case has gone from the Magistrates to the Crown Court um, and starting all over again, de novo, as we say. So the court has two judges or more, OK, and one of them with the Lord Justice of Appeal. So these are quite rare because there's only one law. Um, because there are not many law justices of appeal. So they will hear a point of law that someone has erred in law, the law has been misinterpreted or something like that, or two laws collide, which one has to take precedent, uh, or perhaps saying that the magistrates have acted ultra vires, which is as in beyond their authority. So um, the, 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 the defendant usually appeals, the prosecution occasionally appeals. So let's look at precedent. The decisions of the administrative court Will are binding on the courts below them in the hierarchy, including the Crown Court. Uh, the Administrative Court is bound by the Court of Appeal and, of course, the Supreme Court. That should kind of go without saying. Maybe get the hang of that bit now. So appeals. Appeals from the Administrative Court can go up to the Supreme Court uh, on a point of law. Again, if it is so vital, it would affect the broader public. It's not pertinent just to this particular case. But they must get leave to appeal from the Administrative Court or indeed the Supreme Court. Leave to appeal just means permission. Um, so onto the Crown Court. What are, what are its um, functions? Well, it's the main criminal court and it doesn't hear that many matters because most less serious matters are handled by the Crown Court. It's the one that the public most um, most thinks of when we hear about a criminal trial. These are usually quite dramatic ones and they're various centres around England and Wales. Um, so uh, there, so we know there's a three-tier system. The first tier centres have a high court judge, and he or she deals with both civil and criminal matters. The second tier ones have a high court judges who only deal with with criminal cases, and the third tier, tier centres have recorders or in circuit judges, again hearing criminal courses, criminal cases only. The high court judges are said to be on the circuit because they travel around, they're from the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court. So the Crown Court will hear um, a case which arrive on indictment, and that means that they are heard before a jury, or when the jury vote guilty or not guilty, it's not the judge decides that, um, in the Crown Court. Well, Magistrates Court is different on that, there's no jury in the Magistrates Court. And so Crown Court is hearing things like murder, rape, burglary, supply of Class A drugs, things like that. Um, conspiracy to murder, I'm not sure what else there would be, kidnapping, arson, has to be things attracting major sentences like two years minimum sentence. So precedent, the Crown Court does not set precedent and again is followed by the Administrative Court of the Queen's Bench Division and the other ones, you're used to it now, Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. So appeals, the Access to Justice Act 1999 set up a new system uh, which said that appeals um, by way of the case stated to the Administrative Court of the Queen's Bench Division uh, are introduced by the Crown Court. And uh, when they hear a case um, afresh uh, on appeal from the Magistrates Court, but prior to that, these were only available if you, they were coming from the Magistrates Court. So appeals from the Crown Court, um, which have a trial and indictment, um, th these go to the Court of Appeal, Criminal Division. So appeal against the conviction from the Crown Court to the Court of Appeal can be appeal on the facts, or the case of the law, they said it my fingerprints, they weren't. Or the law, the judge erred in law, something like that. Or, you know, some, some evidence wasn't disclosed to the defence. Um, and um, so the Attorney General makes seek the opinion of the uh, Court of Appeal on a point of law which has been thrown out by the case. That's under the Criminal Justice Act 1972. So this will make the law crystal clear. So reference by the Attorney General, if it works, doesn't change the, uh, the result of this particular case. Um, it doesn't uh, turn an acquittal into a conviction, but we still learn something about the law. So uh, the defence can appeal to the Court of Appeal against a sentence imposed by a Crown Court saying it's unduly harsh. So the Criminal Justice Act 1988 grants the Attorney General the, the power to apply to the Court of Appeal for permission to um, refer a sen uh, review a sentence under certain certain. Uh, um, offences saying this is just too soft. It ought to be. It ought to be 
uh, harsher, and sometimes it does. I bumped into Dominic Grieve on the tube one time, I was asking about a particular case, when people were saying, oh, well, it's too lenient, and he said, well, this is of a nature that actually can't be increased, and it couldn't. And he was Attorney General at the time, himself a barrister or QC, but again, it's not a political decision, it's out of his hands, judges have got to deal with it, because otherwise he gets too politicised, oh, this will be popular, so I'll commit injustice. Do you see what I mean? Give him an unduly harsh sentence, or it'll be popular to reduce sentence. No, that would be wrong. It's got nothing to do with popularity or unpopularity. Clear that out of your mind. Stop thinking about elections. Do the right thing. Popular or unpopular, it's immaterial. Fiat justitia ruat celum. Um, let justice be done, though the sky should fall. So the Criminal Justice Act of 2003 allows the prosecution, with the approval of the Director of Public Prosecutions, to apply to the uh, Court of Appeal for an order which will um, overturn the acquittal of anyone found not, not guilty of a serious offence. The Court of Appeal has to rule if there is um, sufficient new and uh, damning evidence against the person who's been found not guilty. And that was something that arose in the Stephen Lawrence case, because this was breaking the, the, the centuries-old double jeopardy case. This was a highly contentious decision by the Labour government at the time. But these appeals are often after an investigation launched by the Criminal Cases Review Commission, and that was set up by the Criminal Appeals Act in 1995. So the Criminal Justice Act therefore says there is a this this exception to the double jeopardy rule. If a person has been found guilty, the person so not guilty, the person can be tried twice for the same same offence. And the first example of this was the person who was acquitted of the murder of of, of Stephen Lawrence, um, in 1994, and then he was um, tried again, um over something about 15 years later and found guilty the second time or like in scotland the the world's end murder this pub at the end of the royal mile in edinburgh two 17 year old girls met by a man walked off with him in, in 1978 their raped and murdered bodies were found a couple of days later the police fingered a suspect they felt it was a culprit charged with murder he stood trial found not guilty he was set at liberty 30 years later he was charged with the rape and murder of the same two minors and found guilty because some new evidence had come to light. It's not, let's just have another shot at it. No, 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 no. You found some DNA, a fingerprint, an eyewitness or whatever. It has to be something quite strong. So anyway, so the magistrate court in criminal proceedings, um, what's it all about? Well, 98% of criminal cases um, uh, end with the magistrate's court. Okay, that's that's almost everything. All, all, the, all the minor stuff, the shoplifting, the vandalism, the assault cases. So these are summary offences, as we call them, as in trifling ones. Some are tribal either way, um, as in they could be tried by the magistrate's court or indeed by the crown court. So the magistrate's court is able to um, fine you up to £5,000 or award you a sentence of, 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 of six months for a single offence. If you don't multiple times, it can be more than six months. So the magistrate's courts sometimes um, can't deal with the case because they don't have sufficient sentencing powers, they believe, and send up to the to the crown court who may wish to uh, impose a sentence of more than six months. Um, anyway, so uh, the Crown Court trial is sometimes seen to be more suitable. And they may, uh, so the, the, the um, sometimes they find the person guilty in the magistrate's court, they go to the Crown Court for sentencing because the sentence is likely to be over six months. Doesn't have to be. Occasionally the Crown Court say, no, under six months, five months, three months, whatever. So precedent. The magistrate's court, again, doesn't create create precedent because it's the bottom of the pecking order. And again, of course, it's got to follow the administrative court of the Queen's Bench Division, the Court of Appeal, and lastly, the Supreme Court. So how about appeals from the, from the Magistrates' Court? These go to the to the Crown Court, or we say lie to the Crown Court, Crown court. and that's where the defendant um, has to, is able to appeal against the conviction. Now, in this situation, the case is said to be heard de novo, which means um, the whole thing is is done all over again. The prosecution is not allowed to appeal against acquittal. If you're not guilty, you're free to go. Okay. Now it's, it's possible that years later the police come across evidence which they think is um, very potent indeed and could charge you again, but that's vanishingly rare. Um, uh, or indeed the prosecution said if you are found guilty, um, uh, uh, you and the sentence is too soft. Well, they're still not allowed to appeal in the magistrate's court. Um, if the defendant appeals to the magistrate, from the magistrate's court on a point of law, there is a certain correct route which um, they have to follow. Um, and uh, that is this. They have to go to the administrative court of the Queen's Bench Division, and that's called appeal by way of case stated. The prosecution doesn't have a right to appeal, as I previously said. So I hope that's um, given you a few pointers about this. Now on to the um, Privy Council.
the judicial, the judicial committee thereof. Um, well, what is the makeup of it and how does it work? Well, that is the last court of appeal in the UK. And for certain overseas territories, like, say, the Cayman Islands, Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, Gibraltar, uh, these are crown dependencies. So uh, certain Commonwealth um, countries have still kept that as their last court of appeal, even a few republics, some of the Caribbean countries. So what's the reason it's there? Well, the Judicial Committee was there to advise the Crown. So um, in theory, it doesn't actually decide the case, but it only advises Her Britannic Majesty. But the Bonnock has never, ever rejected the advice of the Judicial Committee. So it deals both civil and criminal matters. So there are high ranking members of the judiciary. Um, so from the House of Lords and occasionally they're from Commonwealth countries. Um, so uh, they, uh, there have been some vital cases they've decided, and some of these came from Australia and New Zealand originally. Now, Grant and Australian um, Knitting Mills, 1936 is one of these, about this doctor who bought these trousers and the, it, it caused him some skin irritation. He had to take a holiday to New Zealand to deal with it, this dermatological condition. Uh, or the Euromed, um, uh, Euromed on 1975. Um, that's a New Zealand case of Pao On and Lao Yu Long, 1980, a Hong Kong case of contract law. Obviously, I don't think Hong Kong deals with it anymore. They're a special administrative uh, um, division or region, rather, of the People's Republic of China. But um, the Privy Council is now um, not as broad as it used to be. So Australia and New Zealand have severed all links with it. So some of the um, Caribbean countries... Uh, deal with it, Bermuda and Gibraltar, as I said, Guernsey, Jersey, Guernsey, Jersey, Sark and Alderney, various Channel Isles. They're all politically separate, judicially separate, but they all go up to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. So precedent. Now, the decisions, strangely, are not binding on the courts of England, but there are, they often persuade um, judges. Oh, well, that's one way of handling it. I might go with that. So they're, they're regarded as um, authoritative on a similar plane to the House of Lords, or as we have now have the Supreme Court. And that's because the Privy Council is composed of judges who previously sat on the, the Supreme Court, or as it used to be, the, the House of Lords. So they are antiquities in themselves. So one notable example of a, a precedent created by the Privy Council um, is in criminal law, and that's in 2005, the Privy Council. Um, it sat with nine judges and heard Her Majesty's Attorney, Gen Her Majesty's Attorney General for Jersey and Holly. Um, so this was the um, the defense characteristics had to be thought about when there was a case of provocation. So Lord Nichols said this appeal being heard by an enlarged board of nine members is concerned with, with to resolve the conflict and clarify definitely the present state of English law and hence Jersey law on this important subject. So Jersey is an island close to the coast of France, but it's um, a dependency of the United Kingdom that's not actually part of the United Kingdom. And uh, they got their own courts, mainly, mostly English law. Though I remember a lawyer from there told me they had to sit an exam in Gerrier's, which is their type of Norman French. Um, so the law lords sitting on this case were Lord Bingham, Hoffman and Carswell, this minority who accepted that the effect of the majority decision, um, and that was the majority judgment. The majority said they're going to break with the House of Lords decision in R and Smith Morgan, a 2001 case. case. Then the, the, the Court of Appeal, which had five judges in R and James, R and Karimi, decided they were going to follow the um, persuasive Privy Council decision in Holly and not the binding decision in the House of Lords. That was revolutionary. So in R and Smith, um, Lord Phillips of Mad Travers, who was the Chief Justice, he said this is why they did it, which is unprecedented. What exceptional features in this case which justify preferring the decision in Holly to that in Morgan Smith, we identify the following. All nine Lords of Appeal and Ordinary sitting in Holly agreed with the course of their judgments that the result reached by the majority clarified definitively the English law on the issue. The majority in Holly constituted half the appellate committee of the House of Lords. We do not know whether they would have been in agreement with that result was definitive had the members of the board been divided 5-4. In the circumstances, the result of any appeal on the issue to the House of Lords is a foregone conclusion, as in they would definitely win. So in this recent case, Willis and Joyce, 2016, the Supreme Court clarified the position and they said the Privy Council should think of itself as being bound by judgments of the Supreme Court, previously the House of Lords, when it applies English law. The Privy Council's judgments are not binding on domestic, uh, domestic courts 
and they shouldn't be followed rather than precedent be followed. The Supreme Court say, said that we're going to have a new procedure, and this allows for the Privy Council expressly saying we're breaking with the previous precedent of the House of Lords or the Supreme Court, or indeed the Court of Appeal, and saying that English courts should um, say, to, should say um, by the way, the, the Privy Council, this is making English law, and English courts should follow it. When I say English, that always means English and Welsh. Um, so that is a really new attitude to precedent. And it's about substance rather than form. Sounds a bit like equity. Um, so uh, the president of the Privy Council um, is the same person as president of the Supreme Court. And the judges sitting in the Privy Council are usually judges who are also in the Supreme Court. So the procedure is to allow the law to um, evolve without being stymied by sticking to unthinkingly to the forum in which the case is decided. Is it the Supreme Court? Is it the Privy Council? Um, the, the distinction between them is blurred. I know they're two different locations, but they're often the same people. It's the same law. So we shouldn't be too pedantic about that. So onto the Court of Justice of the European Union, on the European Court of Justice, as we sometimes used to call it, ECJ, which sits in Luxembourg. So um, anyway, uh, it's, it's only in 2010 it got that rather long, lengthy name, the Court of Justice of the European Union. So um, it deals with European law. So um, you can't appeal from the courts in your member state to this court. And of course, the United Kingdom is no longer a member state of the, of the EU. So uh, there's a thing called a preliminary reference. The Court of Justice doesn't decide what the outcome of the case is going to be. It doesn't make decisions about the facts. Is this true or false? Um, it is only responsible for applying the law to the facts. It just has to assume that the facts presented before it really are facts and not falsehoods. Um, so it only makes a ruling on the validity of the EU law or, or interpreting European law. So that's called a preliminary ruling. And then it's up to domestic courts to implement it. So on to the European Court of Human Rights. This here's cases about the European Convention of Human Rights. It's a Strasbourg court. And um, it can only be brought against, you can only bring a case there when you have run out of domestic remedies. So um, it might be dealt by a single judge, it might be dealt by more judges. Um, uh, that's according to just how important it is. A committee of three judges or a chamber of, of seven judges, that's very rare. It's got about 45 judges, one for each from each signatory state. So the big cases can be heard by, by a grand chamber of 17 cases, but that's highly unusual. So if the court says a convention right, as in a right from the European Convention on Human Rights, has been breached, it can say there has to be water compensation. Just recently in Azerbaijan, um, Khadija Ismailova, this um, dissenting journalist, she was awarded thousands of euros by this court because uh, her government has been persecuting her for uh, um, doing her media work, saying things that the executive finds disobliging. So the thing is, it's not enforceable. You can just say, you can just say, Boo sucks to you if you're a, a state like Azerbaijan and there's nothing they can do against you. But what's being what's the point of being signed up to it if you're not going to abide by its rulings? Well, that's just a little bit about the court's hierarchy in England and Wales. Toodaloo.